testing. Hello. Great. Welcome, everyone, to the Electoral Area Services Committee meeting of March 15th, which is my son's birthday, so it's an exciting day at our house. <laughs> um, I would like to um, start by respectfully acknowledging that we live and work on the traditional and the unceded territories of the Coast Salish and New Chalnoth people, and we offer their grati our gratitude to them for their care of the earth and their teachings about our earth, and we hope we're able to respectfully bring those teachings to the work that we do today in committee. With that, I'll turn to our corporate secretary. Corporate secretary, what do we do next? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, for those that are joining us remotely, uh, that have business in front of the committee today. If you could turn off your video until such time as uh, the chair recognizes your agenda item, that would be great. We appreciate that. Uh, so the f your first order of business is the approval of agenda. There are a couple of item changes in item R5. There is uh, a, a new supplemental uh, information uh, which includes a cer new certificate of sufficiency and a, a new resolution. Uh, this is just an oversight of uh, staff with respect to the recommendations. We're talking about the strata lots 1 through 28, not 1 through 10 and 12 through 28. It's actually 1 through 28, and the supplemental information reflects that. And the other uh, is actually a new piece of business uh, under C, under closed session, item agenda, uh, agenda item 12, CSR2. And that's a verbal report from the Acting General Manager, Land Use Services, um, uh, going into in closed session under the Community Charter, Section 90, Subsection 1, K and J, CSR 2. And so with that. Thank you. Um, any changes or anything you want to add to the agenda? Committee? Do I have a motion to approve? And a seconder? And all in favor? Agenda is approved. Adoption of minutes. The recommendation that the minutes of the Electoral Area Services Committee meeting of March 1st, 2023 be adopted. Any changes or omissions? Motion to approve. Second and all in favor? And it's approved. No one's... What's the word? When you disapprove? No objections. No objections. <laughs> oh, no, there's another yeah. word. Okay, hope I don't forget there more are no, things There are uh, no business arising for the minutes that staff are aware of, which then moves you, Madam Chair, to public input period. Great, do we have any public input? And we do. Mr. Evans, welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, this commission has a real tough job to do, looking at all the development permits and uh, rezoning permits and uh, it's almost an impossible task to follow everything. And what I've noticed uh, happening in the last few years is uh, bu building or construction taking place in riparian areas, and you think, who on earth ever let that go? I mean, there's a creek or tributary to Shawnigan Creek right here. The salmon used to go up there. How'd this happen? And it, it all happens here because you're the people that, that have to approve this. And it's a very important job. I was very happy to see something come up on uh, Cocosala Road with the fire hall. And uh, Director Abbott wasn't quite sure of it. And he deferred it. And he went down and he looked at it. And, and that's what we need because we find woodsheds being built out on, on uh, 
the road allowance, where we should maybe have a path or something like that. So your job is very, very important. In some way or another, the APCs are not getting a chance to uh, look at riparian zones, and we need them looked at. And, and the idea was we have professionals writing these off. Well, in the real world, what really happens, these professionals are 99% good. But if they have a buddy or something like that, or they're working for a developer, uh, if, if they don't put out, pretty soon they don't have a job. So Madam Chair, I'd like to see our APCs become more involved, just to have a look. And I'd like to see our directors get out if possible, just to have a look and see uh, what's really going on. Because what's on paper hasn't always been what's happening. If you see a, a development permit where it says we're going to put uh, 50 truckloads of, of gravel in our drinking water reservoir, maybe we better think about these things another time and see if there's some options. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, anyone else? I don't think I see anyone else. Anyone online? No one online. All right. Moving on. Under agenda item five, five, there are no delegations, which moves you to section six, correspondence. C1 through C5 are requests for grant and aids, and they're each has a recommendation. C1 is a grant and aid request, electoral area A, Mill Bay, Malahat, with regards to Francis Kels Kelsey Secondary School. Would you like me to read out yes, the recommendation? That would be recommended to the board that a grant and aid, electoral area A, Mill, Mill Bay, Malahat, in the amount of $2,000 be provided to the Francis Kelsey Secondary School for two $1,000 bursaries for two graduating students that reside in electoral area A, Mill Bay, Malahat, to support their future education of training. It's been moved. Could I have a seconder? Any discussion? All in favor? No opposed. Yes. Um, I think um, just in the, um, for brevity, is it possible to move these forward as, as a group because they're all granting aid? If that's, uh, if I can get a, a seconder on that motion. I think we agreed last time that it was important to have them, the motions read out oh, okay. for the record for at least the first time. At the board, we can do them in blocks. Okie doke. Thank you. Carry on. Uh, C2 is a grant and aid request, electoral area, Mill Bay, Malahat, with regards to Couch and Women's Health Collective. That it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid, electoral area, A, Mill Bay, Malahat, in the amount of $500, be, be provided to the Couch and Women's Health Collective to support legal costs to become a charity. That's moved in a seconder, and all in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. C3 is a grant and aid request, electoral area, A, Mill Bay, Malahat, with regards to Francis Kelsey Dry Grad. The recommendation that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid electoral area A, Mill Bay, Malahad, in the amount of $500 be provided to the Francis Kelsey Dry Grad to support the 2023 Dry Grad celebration. And it's moved. And do I have a seconder? And all in favor? Anyone opposed? It's quite carried. C4 is a grant and aid request electoral area E, Couch and Station Sotlam, uh, Satlam, Glen Nora, uh, Couch and Historical Society. That it be recommended to the board that a grant in the aid electoral area, E, Couch and Station, Satlam, Glenora, in the amount of $3,000 be provided to the Couch and Historical Society to support the museum operations. Uh, I have a motion. I have a, uh, it's been moved. <laughs> Anyone like to second it? It's been seconded. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Motion carried. C5, recommendation that it be recommended to the board that a grant need electoral area E, Couchin Station, Satlam Glenora, in the amount of 2000 be provided to the Duncan Couch and Chamber of Commerce to support the year-round visitor servicing operations of the Couch and Regional Visitor Centre. And it's been moved and seconded. All in favour? And anyone opposed? I was the big spender this week. <laughs> All right, moving on. No items under seven information, but moves you to reports. R1 is a report from the Development Services Division with regards to application number CLR22A01, that's 2734 Barry Road, PID 00580841. Welcome, Ms. Woods. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, I'm sure this site is uh, very familiar to most of you, as in February of 2022, or sorry, 2023, the board just adopted a zoning amendment uh, to permit for cannabis retail sales as a site-specific use on the property at 2734 Berry Road. Um, because it's also familiar to you, I'm going to keep this presentation as short as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So the applicant, which is Rise Cannabis, uh, and I do believe the applicant is in the waiting room as well. Um, they are now oh, seeking a- Hang on, we should let oh, them yeah. in. All those waiting have been let in, Madam Oh, Chair. okay, so the applicant's here, great. Oh, Carry on, sorry. No problem. Um, so Rise Cannabis, who is the applicant, is now seeking the approval for the cannabis retail license, uh, which will occupy the unit that's identified with the red star on the site plan before you. Rise Cannabis is a confirmed living wage employer uh, and has applied to the LCRB for cannabis retail license, which re uh, requires the CBRD board's concurrence. The LCRB will not proceed with a licensing application unless the CBRD submits a positive recommendation. And next slide, please. As promised, I was gonna keep it short, so the recommendation is before you. Thank you. Um, does the applicant have anything to add? That's Graham Ames, who's joined us electronically, virtually. Mr. Ames, do you have anything to add? Uh, I'm just here to answer questions uh, and provide information. Um, if uh, anyone has any, um, uh, this is our fourth store. We have um, one in View Royal, one in um, Colwood, uh, one in Tillicum Mall opening next week. And this will be our, our fourth location. We're a living wage employer at all of our locations. Um, we've been, um, we also have two liquor stores, um, and we've been, uh, retailers for the last 40 years. I'm part of the family. My parents started the business. Um, so we've been working with the liquor control and cannabis branch for decades now. Um, we have a long track record, uh, of responsible retailing, um, and are excited to uh, possibly work in the CBRD, but I'm more than happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I don't see any questions. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. So do I have a motion? I have a motion to approve the recommendation and it's been seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, the motion's carried. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Next. Uh, which is R2, the report from the Development Services Division with regards to application number DVP23C01, that's 910 Chapman Road, PID 03063532. I don't see the applicant online. Welcome, Ms. Boyle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, the applicant sent me an email this afternoon saying um, they are not feeling well, so they will be unable to join us. Um, perfect. So the application before you is a variance application for 910 Chapman Road. Uh, the property is located on the southern border of electoral area C, Cobble Hill, accessed off of a panhandle off Chapman Road. Uh, as you can see, the southeastern half of the property is forested and the northwestern half is the location of a single family dwelling and shop. The applicant is requesting a variance to increase the parcel coverage from 500 square meters to 624 square meters, which would result in 5.5% total parcel coverage for all buildings and structures. Uh, the development services report as part of your agenda package provides a planning analysis of the OCP and zoning bylaw considerations. Development services staff consider the variance request to be reasonable and recommend approval and issuance of DVP 23C01. Thank you. Any questions for staff? I'll turn to the director of the area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I um, am in complete agreement with this particular um, application, so I would like to recommend option one be approved. And I have a seconder. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, the motion's carried. Thank you. That goes to, okay, we're supposed, supposed to know which board meeting this goes to now. 22nd? This will go to the 22nd of March board meeting. Thank you. Moving to R3 is a report from the Development Services Division with regards to application DVP22D02. That's 4614 
Caldwell Road, PID 0317405370. Uh, the applicant is not joining us today. Oh, welcome, Mr. Buchan. Thank you. <laughs> A new planner. New planner. You're here for a month now. Welcome to this place. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, application is being received for a development variance permit for the property at 4614 Galdwell Road. Next slide, please. The purpose of this application is to request that the maximum permitted impervious service area for the property be increased from 35% to 39.6%. If approved, the property owners would be able to construct a single detached dwelling with combined front access driveway and walkway and an at-grade patio in the rear yard. Both of these would be constructed with impermeable surface materials. Uh, a site plan is included, as well as a rationale in the appendix to the, to the staff report. And the applicant is proposing to direct the additional stormwater into an existing storm drain connection. As part of staff's preliminary review, concerns were raised about the tie-in of additional um, runoff associated with impervious surfaces, and specifically oh. concerns that this would put additional demand on storm drainage infrastructure, and is therefore not supported due to capacity concerns. For these reasons, the recommendation, next slide please, oh, there we have it, uh, is to deny the application. And there are some alternative options available to the applicant. For example, they could use permeable paving materials in the patio or the driveway. Here for questions, thank you. Thank you, is, so I, I can't remember, is the applicant in the room? No, no they no, okay. uh, sent their regrets. Right, all right, so do we have any questions for staff? Yes, Director Morrison. Thank you and welcome. And I don't know why your colleagues were chuckling at uh, when you were introduced, but uh, this, this is a great place to be and glad to have you here. Um, so this is a, a under 5% request. And I'm certainly not a stormwater expert, but I do know that there are benefits to um, not only having the impermeable surfaces, but the permeable surfaces. and. Uh, in some of the work that's been done in some of the projects that I've been aware of, the, the use of the impermeable surfaces provided there's a, a, a good disposition of those collected waters, hard surfaces can be used effectively. So I get the, the notion that the, um, the, the connecting to the existing stormwater infrastructure isn't recommended. Um, is there a reasonable opportunity for the owners to look at alternative infiltration within the site. I notice it's a very tiny lot. So, you know, I, if, if we're going to deny this aspect, does it open the door for them to have alternative options? Uh, thank you. And through the chair, there are alternative options available. There, again, is the opportunity for, or for permeable surface materials to be used in either the driveway, uh, patio, or both. Um, the applicant could look at uh, coming back with information about uh, on-site uh, storage and detention, but that information was not provided and there wasn't an interest to do it at this time. Any more questions? Director Abbott. Thank you for the, the presentation. And um, it's more of an observation. I just rode through the... Um, uh, took a tour of the subdivision, and I'm drawn to um, continue to lean right into this mic. I, I'm drawn to staff from engineering that um, posited that the concern about providing an allowance here, it, it's going to cause others, in my estimation, it's going to cause others to want to do the same. And I, I would, if I read the report from your, your pen, it sounds like they're not really willing to... Um, make any mitigation efforts to they just want to push ahead and I, I I'm not supportive I think we need to follow uh, engineering staff's recommendation that uh, Vanessa Thompson's second bullet and this plan should also consider the implications of allowing all lots in this subdivision to make similar variance requests for increasing impermeable surfaces I worry about the condition of the subdivision it's just begun there are many more um, sites so we, we concede here then then it's going to, and, and maybe the, just the last comment, um, if, if denial is not permissible, at least send it back to the APC to, to let them have a wholesome discussion on this matter. Thank you, Director Abbott. I guess, uh, um, I guess my question is, this area has drainage issues, does it not? 
uh, through the chair. Uh, our colleagues in environmental services and utilities could help to answer that, but uh, in the staff report, there was some references to drainage concerns. Right. Any more questions? Do I have turned to the director of the area? Madam Chair, I would move the uh, staff recommendation to deny the um, the expansion of impermeable surface coverage. Thank you, and it's been seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Moving on to our four, right? Our four is a report from the Development Services Division with regards to application RZ22D01, Lot 3 and, and 14, Plan 341. And I understand that applicants Jack Anderson and Larry Simon have joined us virtually. Welcome applicants and welcome Ms. Woods again. Thank you, Carry Madam Chair, me again. Um, contrary to my last application, I cannot make the promise of brevity for this one. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to apologize for a couple typos that I had in the report. On page two of the staff report, under the application summary, I had quoted um, the bylaw as CVRD Electoral Area E. It should read CVRD Electoral Area D, Cowichan Bay Uplands. I so, figured that out. Yeah. I figured you guys probably did, but uh, <laughs> sorry for any confusion that may have caused. And um, additionally, at the top of page three on the report, I had noted the APC meeting that took place on November 17th, 2023. I'm not a time traveler. It was November 17th, 2022. Um, <laughs> Thank you to the director uh, who pointed those out. So the subject property is comprised of two vacant lots, which are zoned C5 and regionally designated commercial and have a local area plan designation of Coke Sila Village. The lots are within the Coke Sila Village growth containment boundary. Um, the Couch and Valley Meat Market is located directly to the northeast, sorry, northwest. Um, of the subject property and the old farm market is located to the southeast. Uh, Couch and Tribes R IR number one is located approximately 175 meters to the north of the subject property and approximately 215 meters to the south on the opposite side of the Trans Canada Highway. Subject property is within multiple development permit areas which have guidelines speaking to form and character uh, and green construction. Um, additionally, staff have noted to the applicant that they are within a floodplain and a flood construction uh, level is in effect there. Next slide, please. Oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> the applicant is, proposed, is proposing an amendment to the electoral area D, uh, Couch, and Tribe, Couch and Bay Uplands Zoning Bylaw number 3705 to permit for liquor retail sales and a two meter setback from the interior side parcel line. Next slide, please. This slide rendering just shows um, the two renderings of the proposed buildings with the conceptual building plans. And next slide. Uh, as shown on this si slide, the applicants intend to construct a building which achieves many of the green construction policies that are laid out in the official community plan for the electoral areas. It is important to note that a rezoning application uh, is a land-based discussion and it doesn't secure the building plans. So for this reason, staff do consider these to be conceptual building plans as noted on the slide. Um, and I would also like to point out that as a part of the recommendation, um, staff have also made the recommendation to covenant for those green principles to ensure that should the rezoning go forward, we do have um, those green principles covered in the property. And I will um, leave the coveted task of reading this recommendation to <laughs> Mr. Robbins. Uh, <laughs> apologies for the novel of the, the recommendation here. Thank you. Would the applicants like to add anything? Um, n not really. I'm, we're, we're very excited to, to come forward and, and build another store. It, I operate one in Nanaimo. Uh, yeah, just really excited. Great, thank you for coming. Um, any questions for staff or the applicant? I have one question. It strikes me as odd that we have to covenant at this point in time green building principles. Uh, through the chair, do you mean just in general? And that's just the in general. So the official community plan does state that that is um, something that should be done on, on these sites. Um, again, there are policies, so not everybody comes in with those 
those building plans. Um, we do also have development permit areas. So there is one development permit area 13, which speaks to greenhouse gas and energy efficiency. It's a very long title, I can't remember it. Um, and, and so they, most development that comes in through commercial and triggers form and character, therefore that development 13 as well, um, will be subject to those, those guidelines. Um, but in this case, it is such a scope of green principles that it is uh, staff recommends covenanting for this particular um, property because it is, honestly, it's kind of above and beyond what some of the development permit uh, guidelines state, so which is great. Right, and I suppose once we get our modernized zoning bylaw, <laughs> it could all be built in. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Uh, could, uh, let me turn to the uh, director of the area. No, I have no questions, but I... Would you like to? Uh, I'd be prepared to move uh, staff's recommended uh, option that uh, we proceed with granting. Um, what is it? The the licensing. Yeah. Okay. Do I have a seconder? I've got a seconder. Any discussion? Director McClinton. Just uh, a quick a quick follow up. Just looking at the renderings and so a question then a comment. Um, the the green requirements for the building. Where who came up with the requirements? Uh, through the chair, the developer came in with this right, plan. Right, And just, I, I think I'd like to, in the future to see some science behind that. I, you know, from my tertiary knowledge, I know that most solar panels are made in a blast furnace in China. Uh, and in BC, more than 90% of our energy comes from hydro and renewable sources. So it's probably not, uh, it's definitely a carbon negative um, so I just I, especially that one particular piece of green you know the rest of the stuff looked really good so just a comment there but I'm we'll be supporting the motion any more discussion uh, director Morrison thank you and, and through you to staff and along the same lines as director McClinton um, and, and I'm just gonna make note of we have should and if we really want it, it should be shall or must, but we just have a should in here. So uh, it's, it's, when it comes to covenants, and I'm gonna pick up on something our, our friend in the gallery had mentioned a few, uh, few weeks ago about the, uh, the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of our covenants. The, we're rezoning land and the applicant has brought this in and I, I'm, I'm sure the applicant's got all the greatest intentions to give us something or give the community something along the lines of, uh, of what's been rendered here. What do we actually have in, uh, in hand that will give us uh, a better chance that we're going to get what has been um, suggested in the, in the motion, that we're gonna get something close to the renderings, uh, or is, is this uh, still a little bit of hopefulness on our part that we'll get uh, what's what's been offered up. So through the chair, um, that is why staff is proposing the covenant is so that uh, should this rezoning be approved, um, they will have this covenant registered on title, which will state that they do have to build to these sustainable uh, principles. Um, at this point, as you've noted, um, you know the development permit areas are guidelines um, and we have policies so so at this point um, it's staff's understanding that the best way to ensure these green principles are met is through the covenant and um, if Ms. Pressman has anything else to add for that um, then she, she may have a bit more knowledge on that. Thank you. All right, Director Abbott. Just in uh, just a response to Director Morrison that um, during the APC, the uh, the proponents also demonstrated with other properties that they've constructed in Nanaimo. So there's a certain degree of assurance or we were comforted by what we saw. And uh, this isn't the first, um, this isn't the first plan. So I'm, I'm certainly comforted as are my colleagues at the APC. All right, any more discussion? I'll call the question then. Or did we move it? We did move it, didn't we? Yeah, I'll call the question. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you, Ms. Woods. Uh, R5. 
R5, uh, five is a report from the Utilities Division with regard to uh, MEN Bylaw Number 3711 Mill Spring Sewer System Service Established MEN Bylaw Number 2013. This was subject to a new uh, certificate of sufficiency that refers to strata lots 1 through 28. Welcome. Now, that's, this is a test. Thompson? Yes. Yes, Ms. Thompson. Thank you. Um, yep, so I'm just um, here to present the report to receive the certificate of sufficiency to extend the Mill Bay, or sorry, Mill Springs sewer system area um, to include the uh, 28 lot strata, also known as Winsong strata. And I'm here available for any questions. Have we got any questions, Director Segal? Through the chair, thank you, Ms. Thompson. I'm so excited to see um, groups getting added into the Mill Spring sewer system. I get questions about this often. Um, so I'm really grateful for the conversation we were able to have just to understand the process and that with increased construction prices, um, it's been a real challenge. And so I really appreciate all the work that you and your team have been doing to move this forward. And just for transparency, my only question for the public, for you, to be transparent with the public is as we add on more users to the system, will that affect noise levels or odor levels? Okay, thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, yeah, so as as most of us know, the Mill Springs sewer system was recently um, upgraded through a successful grant application. So um, the design for that plant is actually, actually capable of um, receiving flows much higher than it currently receives with the intention to connect some of these systems that are um, having issues, such as Winsong Strata. Um, so the plant currently operates 24-7, um, constantly processing wastewater already. So additional flows won't change that. Um, we also, um, in the upgrade, we uh, located the, the majority of the, or all of the large equipment that is the loudest within an enclosed mechanical building, um, such as aeration blowers. And also, I'll also mention that Additional connections to a system do provide capacity fees that go towards capital upgrades that could include in the future um, additional mitigation measures for things like noise and odor um, when required. Thank you, Director Abbott. It's probably obvious, thank you, Chair. It's probably obvious, but the definition of the word sufficiency, what does that mean, please? Uh, Corporate secretary helps. <laughs> <laughs> Through the chair, the, the process um, is such that uh, homeowners petition uh, the CVRD to be added into a service. And so the certificate indicates that there were sufficient a number of petitions to go ahead with uh, allowing them into the system and then to go through the process of adopting the bylaws necessary to provide that service. Thank you for that. I, I guess I, I was... Um Wondering whether it had anything to do with the efficacy capacity of the system, but it's just uh, to deal with the, the rate payers that are ultimately going to sign on. All right, I'll turn to the director of the area. Yeah, I'd like to move the recommendation one through three. And it's been seconded. And any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Moving on to R6. R6 is another report from the Utilities Division with regards to budget amendment, uh, Masachi Lake Water and Sewer, Capital Expenditure Reservoir Completion, CWF Funding. There's a four-part recommendation. Would you like to re read it? I don't... Yeah. I'm, I can, for sure. I think... Well, I can okay. move it, too. The, dire the director of the area would like to move it, and if I have a seconder, then we can read it. You've got your mover, Perfect. you've got a uh, That would be recommended to the board that the 2023 budget for function 620 Masachi Lake Water be amended to one, increase transfer from gas tax reserve by up to $100,000 and two, increase capital engineering structure by up to $100,000 and that the 2023 budget for function 810 Masachi Lake Sewer be amended to three, decrease transfer from gas tax reserve by up to $100,000 and four, decrease capital engineering structure by $100,000. Thank you. Any discussion? This is just about moving money around to get important work done. 
<laughs> okay, I'll call the, uh, I'll call the, uh, what do I call? Call the question. <laughs> All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Report R7 is a, from the Utilities Division with regards to Shell Beach Water System Service, Electoral Area H. There's a five-part recommendation for the board. Ms. Thompson, you've got a lot of work today. Would you like to talk to this or? Um, I could just briefly summarize through okay. the chair. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, this is again to present another certificate of sufficiency, now that we are clear on what that is. Um, seek approval to proceed with establishment and long-term borrowing um, and preparation of other related bylaws for the Shell Beach Water System Service Area. Any questions? I move, turn to the director of the area. I would move um, staff recommendation. And I have a seconder. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. R8. R8 is a report from the Emergency Management Division with regards to policy revision, firefighter training, conference lost wage reimbursement. Two part recommendation. Do we have anyone here from online? Okay, where are we? Hi. Mr. Schuler is there Mr. for Mr. Schuler, thank you for joining us. Would you like to talk to this? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just, uh, it, it's about time that we uh, increase the uh, compensation for this. Uh, firefighters are constantly asked to take additional training uh, with very little or no compensation for it. And so we've taken a hard look at this and realized that we need to bring this up to date. Great, thank you. We need to keep our volunteers happy. Um, any questions? Director Abbott. Uh, through the church. Uh, staff, is it at all conceivable that we would um, do this on a regular basis, keeping it current so that we don't take 10 years, 13 years to, to bring it, to have this kind of an increase? Mr. Schuler, Through the chair, uh, absolutely. Um, I'd like to see this uh, reviewed on at least an annual basis. Any other questions? Director Wilson. <clears throat> um, not a question, Madam Chair, more a comment that uh, I keep in fairly close touch with our local fire department and I know the problems that they have with uh, getting and retaining volunteers. So this is a great step in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Sheila, for bringing this forward. And I'm sure the, uh, the fire department will thank you as well. I'm more than happy to uh, let this one go through. Well, then I have a question. This applies only to CVRD fire f halls, firefighters? I'm, I'm sure it does, that's but I'm sure correct. the others will follow. Mr. Schuler? Uh, that's correct, Madam Chair. It's the six CVRD um, sponsored fire departments I'm responsible for. Right. So I can't speak, nor am I willing to speak to the the others. They have their own compensation models. Well, I was just wondering because Director Wilson, I don't think, has a CVRD fire hall in his area. <laughs> no, no, I don't. But, no, I don't. But I'll, I'll be speaking with the fire department chiefs anyway. Thank you, yeah. Madam Chair, for the. Uh, Alrighty. Uh, <laughs> um, any more discussion, Director uh, Morrison? Yeah, thank you. Uh, through you to staff, uh, do we anticipate this uh, having any sort of consequential impact on the individual fire department budgets for 2023? Mr. Schooler. This is, um, the funding for this comes out of the individual fire department budgets. All right, any more questions or would anyone like to move the recommendation? It's be moved and a seconder please and a second. Any more discussion? Okay, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Motion carried. On to R9. Another. Is a report from emergency management with regards to a policy revision for fighter fighter call out remuneration, a two part recommendation. Great, Mr. Shula, this is very similar, is it not? Updating policy. It, it is not fair. Yeah, uh, I, again, uh, the policy uh, was quite outdated. Um, if you have perused the background, it, this policy dates back to September of uh, 2007 when the uh, reimbursement fee was 25 per hour. And current um, BC wildfire emergency management PC rate forty nine dollars per hour. So we're just trying to get up to date. Any questions? Would someone like to move it? I've got a mover and a seconder. Would you like to read it? 
that it be recommended to the board that the fire department personnel uh, be reimbursed according to the reimbursement rate of the current BC wildfire response interagency agreement for volunteer fire department personnel when responding to calls outside of their fire protection area when an emergency management BC task number authorizes the response and two, that the board adopt the revised policy. Any discussion? All in favor? Anyone opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. That would be going, we're on to R10, which is uh, more no, emergency management. Correct. Emergency management uh, division with regards to portable radio replacement, Honeymoon Bay Volunteer Fire Department, um, a two-part recommendation for the board. Um, I think this is pretty straightforward. So Any moved. questions for staff? No. Nope. It's been moved. Seconded. Would you like to read it? That it be Please. recommended to the board that the 2023 budget for function 357 Fire Protection Honeymoon Bay be amended to one, increase transfer from operating reserve by $18,000, and two, increase miscellaneous equipment by $18,000. Any questions? All in favor? Anyone opposed? Motion carried. R11. R11 is a verbal report from the manager, Economic Development Division, with regards to Economic Development Cowichan update. Just in time, wow. you're up. <laughs> We're very efficient, do you know? Do you, want it, do you need a moment? Because we can take a break. Okay, let's take a five minute break. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome, Mr. O'Reardon, for an Economic Development Cowichan March 2023 update. Go ahead. Thank you very much, and uh, glad to be in front of committee today. Um, I've done this presentation to the member municipalities, and normally we go to committee the whole, but I was decided to come uh, to this committee so we can avoid any repetition and give you guys a, a better chance to ask any questions. So I'm glad to be here. So I'm Barry O'Riordan, Manager with Economic Development Couchin with the CDRD. And I'm just providing an update on Economic Development Couchin EDC activities. Do I need to request next slide or can I do that? I can do it. So here are the uh, topics that we will cover today. So first we'll recap on the context of the EDC work plan. And then next, we'll have a look at some data from the state of the Couch and Economy report that was published earlier this year. And then I'll provide an update on activities of EDC activities. So at EDC, our work is guided by both the CVRD corporate strategic plan as well as the economic development Couch and strategic plan, both of which are due for an update. Um, we're also guided by some key strategies, such, such as the industrial land use strategy and the couch and tech strategy. In our work, we continue to see how we can respond to climate change and to be collaborative allies of indigenous peoples in advancing meaningful reconciliation. And importantly, we seek to have our work informed by data, our data. In late uh, January 2023, um, we, EDC published the latest State of the Economy uh, report, which is uh, located on the EDC website and also in your package. So what follows is a few highlights uh, from that report. So as we look at population demographics, we see that Couchin population is growing slowly and aging, but that Couchin popul indigenous population is growing faster and is younger than the overall population. Oh, sorry, my... Uh my notes need to adjustment here. Um, in terms of household income, uh, we see that the median household income in the region has increased in line with the provincial average, which is, uh, which is pretty good news. Um, we see employment shifting between sectors. So where employment in healthcare, construction, services, um, education and public administration rose uh, between this and the last census. Uh, Retail trade, manufacturing, accommodation, food services all saw declines. So we're seeing a shift in, in how employment is allocated within the region. 
and maybe related to that, job vacancy rates have remained elevated, particularly in accommodation food services, as well as retail, construction, and in healthcare. Uh, we see that people continue to move uh, to the region, uh, to Couch and from other parts of BC and beyond. And in terms of farm um, agriculture, we see between 2016 and 2021, the number of farms in Couchin has decreased dramatically, but the total acres farmed has actually increased, which is signaling that this consolidation within agriculture. And of course, housing challenges. Let me get that there. So some context on the housing crisis. As we see, the, the benchmark price for single family dwellings is up 67% in Couchin over five years. And prices have finally started to stabilize at the 2021 levels. And December 2022, we saw the prices were 3% lower than the same month in 2021. But current prices are still a major concern for affordability. So while the issues of housing affordability may be well known, uh, their link to the labor force is less so. When workers are unable to afford housing in Couchin, they're more likely to leave the region, resulting in local businesses struggling to attract and retain staff. This is a story that EC has heard time and time again uh, from businesses across the region. Um, as a result, EDC has work, uh, launched the Couch and Workforce Housing Strategy, uh, which aims to de develop actionable solutions to the housing crisis as it relates to employment. Moving on to EDC activities, I'll now provide a brief update um, of current and upcoming EDC activities. Um, starting with major initiatives underway, including the regional internet connectivity strategy and the workforce housing strategy. So over the past year, EDC has been working uh, on the development of a couch and connectivity strategy. The development of the strategy is a regional objective of the CVRD corporate strategic plan. And the purpose is to provide a better understanding of the state of internet and cellular connectivity in the region um, to create a strategy to meet our needs long into the future. The final report should be presented uh, to the CVRD board uh, later this month. I believe it's on the next community of the whole agenda. And it will include four individual community plans for the communities that are determined the least served within the region, including Didadat First Nation, Couch and Lake Region, Couch and Station, and Thetis and Penelicut Islands. And as mentioned, the CBRD has undertaken a workforce housing strategy, and this work is being led by Economic Development Couchin. The work is being informed by the Regional Housing Needs Assessment and the 2022 Workforce Housing Survey, among other documents. And the strategy will examine and prioritize potential actions throughout the whole housing ecosystem, including local government, nonprofit, and the private sector. So the strategy is three main engagement clusters uh, as part of it. Um, with the first uh, engagement cluster that took place in February, um, looking at understanding this, the scope of the problem and how we should refine that, because we're not going to be able to solve the whole issue, but we can look at where we can be most effective. Um, the next engagement cluster is expected to come up in April, May, um, looking at focusing um, within the scope of the project what the solutions and prioritizing what they might be and we're expecting to complete the strategy uh, this summer. Uh, as mentioned, the EDC strategic plan is due for an update, and um, with the adoption of the budget, that uh, item has been approved for, for the EDC work plan for this coming year. So uh, once we wrap up the workforce housing strategy, we'll be then looking to, uh, to ramp up that project, and it should tie in with the CVRD corporate strategic plan completion hopefully, as well. Uh, moving on to other EDC activities, I'll now provide a brief overview of EDC activities as they relate to the current uh, EDC strategic plan. So firstly, business retention, expansion, attraction, and uh, resilience. So here, in D EDC continues to support inward investment into the region. We do this in a number of ways, from providing timely, relevant information through the EDC website, blog posts, news releases, and print media, responding to direct investment inquiries via email and phone, um, and participation in the Vancouver Island Coast Economic Development Association Investment Attraction Project um, couched under the techisland.io initiative. 
Uh, we're also continuing to support businesses as they transition to a circular economy. In 2022, we did this through the Vicida Clean Tech Attraction Program, which is part of that Tech Island IO project, and also through an, a Vicida project and our leadership in launching a Vancouver Island uh, Circular Economy Accelerator Program to supporting existing businesses within the region uh, transition to a circular economy, and that's uh, with support uh, by Synergy Enterprises. Um, on industrial land, EDC has been working uh, around the use of, to support investment decisions around the use of industrial land within the region and contributing to OCP processes. Uh, the key message here is that the single back, uh, biggest factor impacting investment decisions uh, in the region is servicing of industrial lands. So this is uh, an area deserving significant focus given its critical role in driving investment in both industrial land and in housing. Uh, within agriculture, uh, we continue to support the Island Ag Show, which was held February 3rd, 4th this year, and featured a trade show and a great conference event. Um, the show was really well attended this year, rebounding from challenges uh, resulting from the recent pandemic. So the uh, EDC has been supporting the BC Land Match program since 2018, and this program has been a really fantastic uh, program supporting connecting farmers um, with land within, within the region. And EDC uh, staff sit on the BC Climate and Agriculture Initiative um, for Vancouver Island, their oversight committee. Um, that project is just wrapping up and the CVRD contributed um, some funds toward uh, a winter ve vegetable crop trial project, um, which also was really successful and that project is just uh, in the final stages right now. So you should receive a report on that, um, I guess in the next month or so. So EDC also continues to be connected to the Couchin uh, Food and Farm Hub, uh, which received provincial funding through the CVRD. And I think about 750,000 came uh, through the CVRD to support Couchin Green Community with that project. Um, that project is now expected to be completed in the building of that hub by the spring of 2024. So it's gonna be a major uh, significant advance for the, for the region. As for regenerative agriculture, EDC is aware of the work um, and support of the work that VIU uh, Couchin is doing in the area of regenerative agriculture curriculum development. And we're looking at options and how we may be able to, able to support um, the advancement of that work, uh, particularly within this region. Moving on to tech, EDC support continues to support the tech sector, of course, Key to having a tech-enabled society is having high-speed internet, uh, which we're addressing through the workforce housing strategy. And in 2021, we, we worked with VIU, uh, Couchin, Couchin Tribes, SD79, and industry around the development of a Couchin uh, tech training program curriculum. So developing the curriculum for a program. So we're now um, trying to get support from, from uh, VIU to actually implement that program and fund it and get it get it going um, and then recognizing that tech sector development uh, sometime better done at the regional level um, just speaking again to the the vancouver island uh, tech attraction project through vicida which uh, recognized that investment investors will only really look at maximum vancouver island scale or bc scale when they're making investment decisions on film, uh, the Couch and Film Coordinators continue to attract uh, film production to the island to provide a seamless service for film pro films produ producing here and productions filming here. And the film industry continues to play an important uh, economic role within the region and with uh, productions active in 2022, including holidays and super pups. As for tourism, uh, tourism couch and continu continues to be supported by 4VI. Uh, which was uh, tour, formerly Tourism Vancouver Island to do, deliver tourism uh, services within the region. In 2022, the CVRD and Tourism Couchin uh, renewed the municipal district regional tax at a 2% level for the region. And in 2023, the Tourism Couchin service agreement um, is also up for renewal, the one between the CVRD and Tourism Couchin. Um, in terms of sports tourism, we see that rowing and cycling continue to play, to be seen as a major 
growth opportunities for the region uh, to support support tourism. Last but not least is uh, sub-regional support. So EDC recognizes um, the needs and interests of individual communities are important and that towns and villages remain key to regional economic vitality. So as part of our mandate, we look to support sub-regions through the development and collaboration on sub-regional dev strategies, design charrettes, and community-based initiatives. In 2022, we did have uh, the benefit of having a grant program through Island Coastal Economic Trust that supported uh, sub-regional uh, economic development analyst. Um, that position did expire, um, and it was not renewed, but uh, we are also uh, looking for additional funding from, from ICT and be submitting an application that may continue to support that work as well as the implementation of uh, EDC strategies. So as EDC embarks on the revision to our EDC strategic plan, we continue to look to prioritize the needs of uh, sub-regional support within our unit's capacity. And that is all I have uh, for today, but I welcome any questions you may have, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Mr. O'Rourke. I really appreciate you coming to just the electoral areas and doing the municipal, that kind of makes sense, yeah. So, questions? Director Wilson? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Barry. Good stuff. Um, one of the things that I, you mentioned there, which I wasn't aware of, um, is the Tech Island organization, um, <clears throat> which sounds great because um, I know that v Victoria has a very, very large tech sector. They do very well down there, and that's a, <clears throat> excuse me, the kind of thing that I would love to see come up this way because it's clean, it's well paid, and there's a lot of investment going on in that. That kind of ties it back into <clears throat> what you said about the um, expanding the, the networks that we have here for that kind of thing. They're going to need high bandwidth. Um, so do we have any contacts or have we made any engagements with TELUS and, uh, and Shaw? Uh, to find out if they can start to expand into the less serviced areas that we were talking about. Because uh, that, that's where a lot of the tech companies would like to be. Not necessarily within a hub of a city like Duncan, but further out, that kind of thing. It, what, what have we got as far as engagement with them? Uh, through the chair, <laughs> through the uh, uh, internet and cellular connectivity strategy, we did reach out to uh, all the major internet service providers at the start of that and also formally requested information from them on their on their networks and their plans. Um, I don't believe we received much in the way of uh, feedback from that, um, but the, the broad strokes of that internet and cellular connectivity strategy would look to firstly concentrate on those areas within the region that are under that minimum 50-10 level. Um, because those are the ones that can access servicing, but it also provides some guidance or will provide some guidance on what we can do on the overall network structure and how we can support uh, continued development. Because as you say, 50, 10, 50 download and 10 upload speeds would not be sufficient for, for major tech companies. They're gonna need fiber to the home projects. So I think ultimately that's what will be needed uh, throughout the region where there, uh, there are gaps but the federal information on where those are uh, are not really provided. They say, you either meet 5010 and we don't talk to you, or you're under 5010 and you're prioritized for funding. Yeah. So they don't give you the nuance within that. Thank you. Thank you. Director Morrison, did I see your hand? Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, this is great information and um, enjoyed reading it late yesterday. and, and um, I think I've looked at it before, but I'm I, I'm going to want you to perhaps speculate a little bit because uh, you know a number of us were at a, a couch and housing association event, some of us longer than others. Um, we've got housing crisis, homelessness crisis, workforce housing shortage, tiny home issues, not enough new supply, and then on top of that, we're having homes drained out of the the market by short-term rental uh, purchases. So just in general, do, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel as far as um, our ability to be able to positively impact 
the supply and housing for, you know, we've got a hospital being built and whenever we want to bring new industry into the area, they have to find places for, well, not just the workers, but their executives and their managers. So do you have any general thoughts as to, uh, you know, how we're managing now and, and some of what we may need to do into the future so that we can, uh, you know, build in and, and bring in the new industry that we'd like to see? Through the chair, that, yes, that did call us for speculation. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I could tell you is that, yeah, the workforce housing strategy, we're in looking at that, the issues and where we can focus our attention. It looks like a lot of work has been done on the policy side in terms of um, zoning bylaws and OCP work and a lot of that is being done, but there's probably um, gaps in other areas around potentially like looking at um, housing authority or development corporation to facilitate um, the building of more housing and those partnership elements. I feel that there's probably a bit of a vacuum there in terms of how we can uh, approach and support the development of housing. So I think that's one area that deserves a deep look in terms of, um, I think the Airbnb and VRBO, the temporary short-term rentals, is a more complex issue because I think some people need income to actually sustain the houses that they're living in. Some people need to move to this region and need temporary places to live. But you also have the problem where the highest demand for those places is when you have a tourist season. And that's also when you have issues to do with labor shortages, especially with ESOL and accommodation and food service. So those industries that are both dependent on, on tourism may be losing housing stock to do with that. So I think, one, you need to look at what is the right balance and maybe determine what's the right place and situation where short-term rentals should be provided to the region. That's my personal thought. And then develop that policy coherently and then from there you can look at you can look at other issues like why is there so many uh, vacation rentals maybe there's a need to support the development of more hotels you see Ramada and Duncan which has stopped operating as a hotel right now and looks like it may continue to happen like that so that's another element so it is cut all these things interrelate uh, I'm sorry for the long-winded answer thank you Director Morrison, follow as a, up. As a follow-up, so I'll, I'll be a little more specific. Um, and, and that's great information. It'll support us because I think we have to make some decisions around how we're going to address some of these things. But uh, to be more specific, where are we going to get the builders to build the houses? Because it looks like everywhere you go, there's a shortfall. Any suggestions as to how we encourage that industry, uh, trades or whatever? <coughs> Any thoughts on that? I'll avoid speculation here, but what I can tell you is that, um, yeah, the hospital build is going to drive maybe up to 900 people at the height of that build. So there's going to, and there's already a shortage in the workforce uh, for construction. So there is an issue there for sure. I wonder if um, manufactured homes that can come from elsewhere could could be part of that. But I think we definitely need to look at that and see how we can how we can support that. Again, hotels could could be supportive um, in that area, but it is a highly complex issue that that we're looking at. Thank you, Director Abbott. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Rory, fantastic report. Um, it begs a lot of questions, and I don't want to uh, take up the whole afternoon, but I, I had a couple that perhaps we can talk offline. The Couch and Food Hub comes to mind. You touched on um, the lack of hotel space. If we were to hold a conference like we see at uh, LGLA, we're just not ready. We haven't we haven't got the wherewithal you, you referenced from ADA. Um, and I'd love to know if you have a sneak preview on the uh, connectivity strategy, or just glancing through the website of EDC, uh, could some of this material be a little, uh, 
can we have more about what 4BI is doing in attracting hotels or the construction of hotels? Is it in their purview? Uh, like you're you're on a you're you're on a, a bit of a, a volcano of excitement, and the couch and has all the right um, elements. Loriani Denardo and I were walking on the beaches um, near Cowichan Bay, and, and it was just kind of magnificent yesterday to see swans paddling along with us. So we we have this gem, but we're easily bypassed. Is my speculation. So I, I don't expect an answer. I just it's more a commentary. Director McClinton. Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would just respond to the chair that I'm not aware that 4BI is specifically working on that. Um, the only mechanism I'm aware of um, around hotels, uh, I don't, Mark, uh, Corporate Secretary could uh, let us know if that's applicable to regional districts too, is a potential um, taxation exemption for municipal taxes around the development of hotels that and Nanaimo uh, uses that, and they did have a recent development. I'm not sure how much that uh, impacted the development, but it's maybe more of a signal that we're interested in hotels as opposed to being a strong uh, lever. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, for lending me your mic. Uh, I, I, yeah, a couple questions. I'll try to be brief. Um, yeah, this, this this topic obviously hits home for me, no pun intended. It, it, you know, I'm just curious, is there any in other jurisdictions, any like really innovative things that we may want to consider that are making like meaningful differences? Like, you know, as an area director, you're like going to improve carriage homes, but is there something that we as a board can consider that maybe fits with our um, desire to remain green and abide by our climate um, action agenda, for lack of a better word? Anything big that you've seen out there in, in any jurisdiction that's been helpful with housing? There, there are a number number of things, but I think definitely looking at where uh, resort municipalities and what they've been going through over the past, you know, twenty or more years, that I think we're at that stage where if we act now, then we maybe don't get such a far uh, down the road that they are in terms of their their crisis point. A lot of those municipalities, they would have. Um, additional uh, measures that they can undertake because they're resort municipalities. So, you know, petitioning the provincial government to have some of those authorities uh, provided to, to local government could be something. Um, but definitely things like looking at, you know, what does a development corporation look like? What does uh, a housing authority that can facilitate um, additional bills and manage affordable housing units within the region, employers providing uh, accommodation to staff, or an organization facilitating that uh, for people who are having issue getting accommodation due to um, racism or, or other issues. Um, there's a temporary use permit thing that, uh, that uh, you clue it did around RVs. Um, so there's quite a number of things, but it's what the board will have appetite for and what um, what makes sense within the regional district, given we may not have you know, the same enforcement capil capabilities or water servicing within electoral areas to deal with those things. So yeah, um, yeah those, are, those are some of the things. But I think we, we also answer. have yeah. uh, quite a good housing stock with fewer people living in them, so making better use of the existing housing stock within electoral areas, um, seeing if we can find solutions there, I think would be really valuable too. To follow up, if yes. I may, do you, do you think that, I, I'm, I think that we're aligned with most of the directors in most areas are looking at carriage homes and sort of secondary homes. Did, can that have a meaningful impact on this, do you, in your estimation? Like, I'm just thinking about lot sizes and land just across the region. Or is that, that minor? I, I, don't, I don't have a I don't have analysis on yeah. that. I expect that a lot of the development will take place within the municipalities, but right. that might be a good longer term approach um, to to issues as opposed to just allowing temporary use permits or something that you're providing long term housing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe more appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, 
but still, I don't have an analysis on that. Yeah, well, good. And just last question, hopefully it's quick, um, for, for your sake. Um, the, you talked about it like industrial areas. Is there, and like the need for that and like simplifying that process, is like have some areas been identified and is, or is that still too far out? Through the chair, yes, we have we have a whole. Uh, in 2019, we published a industrial land use strategy, and within that strategy, there's a whole bunch of recommendations for for local government around implementation. So it's directly there to, to have a you. look. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I have a question about food security. We don't have a food security strategy, do we? We do not. Right. Uh, maybe you could just explain what regenerative regenerative agriculture is, in case people don't know. I don't have a definition right in front of me, but uh, the basic idea is that uh, you would want to um, mimic how nature uh, would provide food and would do so in a way that uh, builds soil as opposed to deteriorates it. So it would mimic natural uh, ecosystems and so if you had a food forest, for example, and you uh, develop it uh, in the same way that nature would make a food forest, then or a forest, then you could have food at the top level, um, mid and low, all providing food for you, while also building soils, as opposed to something that's more extractive and use a lot of uh, chemical industry. Um, Director Abbott. Uh, Mr. Through the chair, uh, if time permits, could you tell us more about the Cowichan Food Hub? What seven hundred fifty thousand dollars seed money will be getting the valley? Through the chair, that one I'd recommend uh, Cowichan Green Community maybe come and provide an update on that project. Um, the overall project was supported through the province, uh, support of the CBRD in providing, getting funding, and we had completed a uh, food hub feasibility study uh, the previous year. So they approached us and Couch and Green Community, and that report recommended the Couch and Green Community build it. Um, the basics of it is that it would be part of the BC food hub network, um, which would support innovation um, throughout the province on food processing and supporting agriculture that way. Um, my understanding is the catch and food are the co-op would use have a distribution center there, permanent home and distribution center, and then there'd be some commercial kitchen space that's available uh, for rent and lease, and then there'd be innovation programs uh, run through that center uh, as it launches and develops. So you have innovation, business development, a space for food processing, and then a distribution hub. Great. Um, one more question for me. I was wondering about cycling tourism, and do we have a strategy around that at all? It seems like that's an area the CBRD could really provide a lot of help. We, through the chair, yeah, we, we currently don't have a strategy. Um, I was in the understanding that uh, the tourism Couchin was going to be undertaking some work in this area, but kind of on closer inspection, I believe they're working more on a marketing program around right. developing uh, tourism, but it's certainly an interest throughout the region and major growth potential. Um, but we don't have any specific yeah. uh, program on that right now. Right. Okay. I think there's a connectivity issue there. <laughs> um, any more questions? Well, that was super interesting. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for and, your time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Mr. Corporate Secretary, what do we do next? Moving through your agenda, nothing under nine unfinished business, nothing under 10 new business. Moves you to question period. Opportunity for the public to pose a question to the chair. Welcome, Mr. Evans. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Madam uh, Chair, during the meeting today, uh, direct Director Wilson asked a question about the fire department and whether they're getting the compensation. And I sent the agenda that we have here 
to Keith Shields. He's the chief of the Shawnigan Improvement District uh, Fire Department. And uh, he just says, thanks for the info clip and uh, that we have in place for our fire departments, all the training and that. So, but quite often I notice that the Improvement District fire chiefs don't get the information. I wonder if it's possible to put uh, these Improvement Districts on the list for the agendas because quite often there's things coming up that do affect the fire departments and it may be something they weren't formally asked to comment on but uh, if something shows up and they can't get a fire truck in there they get a little bit frustrated so maybe uh, could we have the agenda sent to the fire departments the other uh, question I had is, I was listening to CBC this morning, and I heard the um, Minister of Transport has 18 million up for um, study on the ICF. And I wonder if the Economic Development or CBRD can get in on any of that money to come up with uh, ideas for the rail, because I think that's very, very important. Thank you very much. Oh, I haven't had any answers. <laughs> okay, Mr. Evans, let me try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on the um, on the issue of the agendas, so they're public, so the, the improvement districts can certainly access the agendas now, but I think it speaks probably more to uh, our emergency, our fire people, Mr. Schooler, and maybe I should follow up with him about improving di communication with improvement districts because we met actually with a, Cowichan Bay fire people, uh, Director Abbott and I and Director Wilson this week and the same comment was raised so I will follow up with Mr. Schooler to see if there's ways that we can improve that and I, uh, on the ICF and MOTI fun or the, minister the provincial funding for that I will have to ask staff and get back to you. Okay, so well, thanks very much Madam Chair. Madam Chair, would you mind if I made a quick comment to Mr. Evans? Sure. Um, I've got a note here, actually. Oh, six, just a minute. Sorry, Excuse me. Just, just a reminder about the microphones. I, I apologize. They, they are going to be repaired, but you really do need to be in touch. Am I not leaning in enough? You're Sorry. Good, but just, just a little reminder. Mr. Wilson, Dr. Yeah. Director Wilson, lean in. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on that particular subject, Cliff, I do have a note here to forward to the fire chiefs in Mill Bay and Couch and Bay. Uh, details of today's discussions with the um, with the video time slots and um, where to look for those. So that I will be keeping them involved as well. But it would be a good idea for Mr. Schooler to reach out as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. I think we've reached the end and we have to move into closed. Is that correct? That is correct. Three-part motion to uh, move into the closed uh, session in accordance with the community charter, section 90, subsections 1C, 1K, and the addition of a uh, CSR2, uh, additional uh, 1K and 1J. I have a motion to move into closed. Thank you. And seconded. All in favor? Thank you. We'll take another five minutes to 3 o'clock. I'm sorry we're pressuring. <laughs>